that. Okay, so I can record, eh? So well, which is a good thing. It's just recording. Okay, but rather it's just to let you know that we're recording it. Um, and uh, and our normal process uh, for those of you who this is your first meeting, we have a number of people who have not attended uh, before, either in person or, or uh, online. Uh, is um, we have um, an online uh, attendance list, uh, which uh, Nicole has been gathering from you all via the Skype uh, via the uh, chat. Uh, so if you haven't yet put in your name and your affiliation, please do so now. And she will then update the wiki page for this meeting uh, and she'll share again the link to that wiki page in the chat in a few minutes. Unfortunately, Zoom does not share the chat with new people when they join, so we have to repeat some information. Um, so we do, we, that's how we do attendance. Uh, so we, do, we don't spend time introducing each other. Uh, hopefully, if you want to find out about each other, you can go to the LinkedIn group and look each other up there and let's get background information. Uh, but we do encourage you to talk to each other uh, offline and, and between meetings. And uh, many of us are engaged with members uh, on various projects. And uh, I'll mention a couple of those in the introductory presentation in a moment. Um, then what will happen is I will have a few slides to kind of introduce the group uh, and to, to set the scene in general terms. Then I hand over to our speaker this month. Uh, and this month it's uh, some uh, members who are based out of Georgian College, which is uh, just north of Toronto, and they will introduce themselves and present their uh, very interesting work on flourishing uh, and how they're bringing that concept, which relates very strongly to strong sustainability, uh, into the world. Uh, and uh, they will let us know how they should handle questions uh, as we go through. And then uh, at the end, I'll have a few closing remarks so we'll, we, we do wrap up on time at six o'clock, so we just need a couple of minutes at the end. Uh, we need to hold back for, for that final closing. Uh, and for those of you who are in the room and uh, those of you who might be in the room in the future, it is our uh, habit to go for a beer or drinks uh, afterwards, uh, or even dinner, um, and to continue the discussions for those of you, those of you who are here physically. And obviously, if any of you are there as groups online uh, from various places around the world, uh, you feel free to uh, follow this pattern wherever you are in the world. Okay, so with those remarks, I think I shall, I shall now start. So, uh, Nicole, would you like to uh, un, uh, start the recording? Or you were recording? You are recording. Okay. Uh, so, uh, welcome everybody uh, to the 76th monthly meeting of the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group, the start of our sixth year, is that right or is it the seventh? Seven. Seventh year, yes, 2012 we started. Uh, and um, uh, we have a, a, an exciting lineup of speakers uh, already scheduled for the first few months of this year and, and some space later this year. So if you're interested in speaking, you know, don't be shy of contact. Our community animator, Nicole Norris, who is also our presenter this month, um, uh, to let them know what your ideas are. So we are recording this meeting. Uh, if you don't wish to be recorded, I'm afraid I have to ask you to leave, but I hope you don't. Um, so, uh, I have a few words of introduction uh, and then I'm going to hand over to our speakers uh, from Georgian College. So, uh, I, uh, this is the Strong Sustainable Business Model Group and we're here as a group to explore how to enable entrepreneurs and establish businesses to realise enterprise that choose flourishing as their goal. And that's the work we've been doing since 2012 and there's a bunch of places you can find us in, online on the screen right now. Uh, this presentation, by the way, will be shared along with the presentation from the speakers and the recording of the presentation today uh, in our Google Drive, and that link will be shared via the LinkedIn group uh, uh, after this presentation is over. So, uh, as uh, many of you know, here in Canada, we had a truth and reconciliation process, which finished a few years ago now, uh, to uh, deal with the reality of our situation between uh, the people who have settled Canada more recently and those who have been here for much longer. Uh, and uh, part of that, uh, the uh, recommendations from that truth and reconciliation process was that uh, we should acknowledge the land on which we are gathered here today from a Canadian perspective. And obviously we're a global community. We have people here from uh, at least uh, two continents and possibly three uh, today. And so we generalize that acknowledgement uh, to be applicable to a global community such as ours. So we'd like to acknowledge uh, that wherever we are today, the land on which we're privileged to be, this land, the nearby lakes, sea, has supported human beings for thousands of years and is rich in history, knowledge, and tradition. And we're privileged to be the beneficiaries and the stewards of all that has come before on behalf of the seven generations to come 
and beyond. And we invite you to consider in your place how you can <coughs> respect people's indigenous to your place, including many of you yourselves. Today, in each, in each place around the world, we're in, it's increasingly a home to people from across the world, and we're each grateful to have the opportunity to be where we are today. So that's a, a social recognition of where we are and the, the, the geographical nature of the place. The other recognition we should make is a, a biophysical one, uh, since we're thinking about strong sustainability, which includes all three. Uh, so this is a photograph of where we are. We're actually not in the top of this building, we're down below. Uh, at the far side of the, the brickwork there that you can just about see. Uh, that's where the meeting room is that we're gathered in. So, uh, but consider this from your own perspective. Do you know where you are as terms of the watershed that you're in? Nicole, what watershed are you in in Barrow, Ontario, 150 kilometers north of us? That is an excellent question. I'm gonna send that over to our water expert who just happens to be on the call, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, I'm joining you from Aurelia, Ontario today, and that is um, the unceded Anishinaabek and Huron-Wendat territory, which is on the edge of, uh, well, I, I'm actually on the ledge of, lakes, of, of Lake Simcoe in the Black River watershed. Um, Nicole would be squarely in the Lake Simcoe watershed. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much. That's, that's an excellent response, and I invite other people to use that as a model for your response. Here in Toronto, uh, <laughs> Star is uh, on the edge of a creek known as Russell Creek, uh, which uh, is known by the settlers as Russell Creek, and uh, that's something that, the, that they we bury uh, because of pollution to become a sewer in the mid 1870s, so years ago now. Uh, and uh, I, I've been looking for the indigenous name, and I, I know, uh, Lindsay, you, you have the indigenous name of your local river, but I, I don't have the indigenous name of Russell Creek, so if anybody can tell me that, I would love to know. Uh, and of course, uh, the delivery of, of this session is, is interdependent in important ways on the place in which we each are. Uh, and if you visit the bathroom, you'll immediately experience the, the ecosystem service benefits of the watershed in which you are, because that's one of the ways in which your waste gets moved uh, away from you into the environment. Uh, and so for those of you who are using the Flourishing Business Canvas, uh, which is one of the tools developed by members of this group uh, to describe business models that, are, that have the possibility for flourishing, for strong sustainability, uh, you can think about aspects of how your business relates to things like the ecosystem services provided by your watershed using two questions on that canvas, which are the biophysical stops and the ecosystem services. So uh, the group today, uh, as of uh, a few minutes ago, I think we're 1,471 people. Uh, so we grew about 20 people over since our last meeting, uh, and which is pretty amazing considering we're doing no advertising. So people are finding us, so we're not that easy to find. Uh, and uh, we remain, uh, we, we make this claim that we are the first and, and uh, possibly the only group taking action to undertake enterprise strategy and to do organizational design, action research from what we, you might call a micro ecological economic perspective. So, an organizational perspective, not a macro economic perspective. And we are definitely ecological economists, this is where the science of uh, strong sustainability comes from. Uh, we are also uh, the only group we know about that's doing this organizational work using a systemic design approach. So, yes, we like system thinking. Yes, we like design thinking. Better, we like systemic design thinking, which is what we're trying to do in all the work that we do. And we do this with a strong normative purpose. We have a definition of purpose, a why of enabling the possibility for human and other life to flourish on this planet for seven generations and beyond, which is a, an idea that comes from Professor John Aaron Feld, who's a, who's a member. Uh, we get you, so if you're doing work in this space, uh, welcome. Uh, and uh, what we're trying to do, what all of you as members are doing, are trying to put into practice and into action research the latest thinking, the latest ideas. For those of you connected to OCAD, what we're trying to do is to put into practice what is being taught to the Masters of Design Strategic Foresight and Innovation students, such as Nicole, who's uh, now our first uh, our community animator. And what we offer is an opportunity, a global network of possibilities for your education research and deployment. Uh, and uh, increasingly, we're starting to get we're getting stories from our members about how the group is benefiting them uh, and how the projects of the group are benefiting them and enabling the possibility. Um, so the group's goals, the community of innovation practice for a knowledge mobilization initiative. Uh, we're self-organized. This is a, currently a, an entirely volunteer uh, endeavor. Uh, we have um, five streams of interest, which are listed in our wiki at the URL at the bottom there. Uh, and um, we are part of a growing planetary movement. So on this chart, these icon, these uh, logos are things that members have done, uh, things that members have done together, 
uh, things that members are, are enabling and encouraging and supporting in all kinds of different ways. And what marks these icons out from perhaps any other group of things that you might call sustainable business is these people are all very aware of the need to apply directly the science uh, that is behind the definition of strong sustainability for everything uh, that we are doing. If we're trying to create businesses that really are going to enable a, a better future for us all, we need to pay attention to what the science has to say. Um, and of course, we're in sync uh, with the idea of the sustainable development goals, uh, but we go beyond the sustainable development goals. Uh, as you all know, the SDGs approved in 2015 are an amazing gift from humanity to humanity. Um, and uh, first time we've ever had as a, as a species a single set of goals globally. Uh, but unfortunately, they are also a political compromise. And so if you take um, goals, where I always forget which number it is, uh, it is uh, goal number eight, decent work and economic growth. Of course, unending economic growth is not scientific feasible on a finite planet. So there are inherent contradictions and limitations to SDG. So uh, we have some people in the group who are thinking about what do we do after the SDG then in 2030. That's the idea of the United Nations Flourishing Goals, which if anybody is interested in talking about. Um, as I mentioned, our members are collaborating on a number of projects. Uh, one is the Flourishing Enterprise Innovation Toolkit project. That's the one that really started the entire group. That's the one I uh, uh, am the convener for. Uh, we also have uh, the Aim to Flourish project, which is looking at education and flourishing. Uh, we had a presentation from uh, Claire Summer uh, last year sometime on that. Reporting 3.0 is another project focused on reporting uh, and um, all the things around reporting for strongly sustainable possibilities to be uh, uh, things to be possible. Uh, the Future Fit Business Benchmark is another one that's looking at measurement. Uh, how do we? How would you tell a truly sustainable, a strongly sustainable, a flourishing organisation if you saw one? Uh, that's the project that uh, my colleague uh, Bob Willard, uh, one of our very early members, initiated back in 2012, as well. I think it was quite a while ago, quite, quite a while ago and, and is getting now some some good traction. Uh, we also have uh, the Lead Flourishing uh, Startup Project, uh, which is part of a, a wider initiative looking at methods. How do we actually help organisations? Uh, become strongly sustainable and start as strongly sustainable. And then we have the Refocus uh, project, which is looking at um, how do we manage those transformations? Uh, how do we help organizations adopt strongly sustainable strategies, uh, whether through their uh, sustainability office or from senior management down? Uh, and we're looking at starting other initiatives. Uh, we've got some interest in starting one on product design. Uh, how do we backcast strongly sustainable products? Uh, one on software and, and others. And we, we encourage our members to talk to each other. Um, how can we work together on these? These projects are all international, uh, and so distance and location are not, are not barriers. And there's some news about evolution that I will talk about at the very end of the meeting today. Um, the other thing that we uh, do is we sustain connections and community with others doing this work. Uh, the first of these is the New Business Models Conference. The, that's actually the fourth one. Uh, is in June this year in Berlin, and the date is actually July the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. So you can fix that on this slide, uh, Nicole. Um, uh, uh, Stephen Davis, myself, uh, led by Maya Hofstock, and others are leading a track uh, at this conference on open innovation for strong, sustainable, flourishing business. Uh, that call is out open until the end of this month, if I remember correctly. Uh, and there are many other tracks that uh, uh, new business models, you can say, certainly include strongly sustainable, uh, also include weekly sustainable as well, but uh, does include strongly sustainable. Uh, that conference this year has been convened by one of our also very early members, uh, Professor Florian Ludecker Freud, who's based in uh, Berlin. Uh, system, and he's not here because it's nearly midnight where he is. Uh, systemic design uh, this is the uh, conference of the methodological people uh, in any field thinking about how to integrate system thinking and design thinking. So we're, we're taking the uh, methodological work, the epistemological work that this community is doing and applying it specifically in the organizational context. Uh, we need to update this one as well. The eighth RSD conference will be in Chicago this year uh, in October, and then we'll get the dates added to that uh, for the next month. Uh, we also are working with the Reporting 3.0 community. Their conference this year is going to be in Rotterdam. And the dates of that are June the 18th and 19th. We'll update the slide to include that. So as many of us will be at that conference as well. Uh, so if you're in Europe, that's a good place to meet us. Uh, and then if you want a, a, a sort of academic perspective on the whole field of, strong, of sustainable and strongly sustainable business model research, 
uh, this paper by Florian and Christoph uh, is a really good place to start. Uh, we also have a blog which is maintained by Florian, uh, which is uh, blog.ssbmg.com, also a strongly sustainable, uh, sustainable business model.org, and that's a good place to keep in touch with some of the latest research in this field, weak and strongly sustainable. Uh, and lastly, we, we have the two founding members of the global B Corp academic community who are members of this community and we do work with them uh, uh, as possible. And many of us here are either in, in the B Lab organization, in, uh, in part of that structure, or uh, are running certified B Corps or the founded incorporated B Corps, the benefit corporation. So lots of connections with the B Corp movement. Another connection point is the Academy for Sustainable Innovation. Uh, this is an initiative by uh, Dr. David Wheeler uh, and it's Canadian focus uh, looking to train hundreds of thousands of people in all the thinking around strongly sustainable um, business uh, and all the things necessary uh, over the coming few years. Um, I won't go into the detail on this one. This is some of the, the key tools and methods that have been developed and are currently in use and testing by this community. Um, won't cover this one either. Um, and we do then have these monthly meetings. The, month, the purpose of the monthly meetings is to share between the members everything that we're all doing in this field. Uh, so these are a few of the past ones. Uh, on our wiki, uh, you will find every single meeting that we've had listed since the very beginning. Uh, and you will find links to almost all the presentations. And for the last nearly three years, we've been recording the meetings. So you'll find meeting recordings of all of those meetings as well. So we're building up quite a uh, a collection of good material if you're a researcher, if you're a student, uh, if you're just interested. So, uh, we are ready for people to engage. Uh, we've got a list of research ideas uh, which members have suggested and if you have an idea for research you think needs to be done in this space, please suggest it on the wiki. Uh, if you want to know how to do that, you can talk with our community animator, Nicole uh, Norris, who's on the call today. Um, and uh, you've also got the opportunity to engage with other members. Uh, on a huge variety of subjects. We, basically, we have the world's leading thinkers on all the topics around all the angles on strong sustainable business in this community. So uh, really a, a, a powerful opportunity for uh, you to engage and share and uh, contribute. Uh, we're also still looking for help. We're looking for volunteers to advance our work. Uh, so I won't again go through the details of this, uh, but if you're interested, uh, please contact myself uh, or Nicole uh, Norris, who's, as I said, on the today. So moving on to today's meeting um, and uh, this is as I said the 76th meeting and I'd like to introduce Nicole uh, Norris and Lindsay Helper. Uh, Nicole in addition to being a student here at OCAD and our community animator is also works at uh, the Centre for Change Making and Social Innovation at Georgian College. Uh, Georgian College uh, is a vocational institution about 125 kilometres, 150 kilometres uh, north of Toronto uh, with locations uh, in, I think, five campuses, if I'm remembering correctly, one of which is in Marriott, uh, one of which is in Aurelia. And so with that said, I will hand over to Nicole and Lindsay. Hi, everyone. Uh, just, thank you, Anthony. Um, we're just going to uh, flip over here. Okay. I'll share our screen with you guys. All right. Um, everybody see this okay yes fantastic all right um as you know uh as uh anthony was talking uh i'd like to sum it up that the stuff he we were talking about is the stuff matters um so i'm going to uh just talk to you a little bit about this and then i'm going to introduce our talk today um so thank you for the opportunity as anthony mentioned this is um, almost grad work <laughs> that you're seeing. Uh, this is the work, uh, this is some independent study work that was done uh, to develop um, a curriculum to teach the flourishing business model canvas to a rural uh, sort of area. Anyways, um, but basically, so this is how we sort of start off um, our conversation about how we introduce flourishing uh, to our community. And uh, I'm going to start here and then I'm going to make introductions and Lindsay can jump on and we can talk a little bit about this. But as you know, um, this stuff matters. And uh, I'm just trying to get this to work here. Um, so we asked the question, do you think this matters? This idea that we have connection? Or what about this? 
we ask this question to a lot of our uh, students and, and people working with us, does this matter, this idea that we have democracy? Or this, this idea that, you know, our communities are local and as much as there's globalization going on, uh, we a lot of times have to really look at, you know, what are some of the effects that happen when we talk about uh, systems and systemic um, choices. And the other great thing about this, about what we really like about the flourishing concept is this. And we ask this to our students a lot of the times too, is does this ladybug matter? And it's interesting to hear their responses from everything from, yeah, of course, to, you know, and they just sort of like, huh? <laughs> but then the best part about this is we ask them, does this matter? And I think this is what um, sort of compels a lot of us is this idea, like we say, is this is our home and we don't have anywhere else to go. So this is how we introduce a lot of this concept of flourishing to our students, because then we say, well, we believe this stuff matters too. And we're CENCO. We're the Center for Social <clears throat> Enterprise Network of Central Ontario. And what we'd like to share with you today is more of a practical approach of how we took a look at the flourishing business model canvas and this journey that we started to go on here uh, regarding how are we going to use this canvas to develop an ecosystem? So first of all, uh, I want to introduce myself. My name is Nicole Norris. I work for the Center of Change Making and Social Innovation at Georgian College. Um, I'm a facilitator in two areas there. I wear two hats there. One, uh, I facilitate with Senko um, on this curriculum that we're about to, to talk to you about today. But I also work with Frontline with students in something called the Community Impact Lab where we work with our students to ask them to look at a wicked problem and ask if collectively together we can hack it. Um, so we use a lot of innovation thinking, we use a lot of systemic design uh, methodologies, and we use design thinking um, to look at some of these problems and hopefully create change makers. So uh, that's me. Um, my background actually too as well has been before I came into academia. Uh, I spent 20 years in the corporate world in product development and product design. So I was one of those um, people that put another product on the shelf at the Walmarts of the world. Um, and if you can also believe it, I spent about two years in NASCAR. So I've got a sort of a sordid history uh, as to how I'm now uh, sitting here um, talking about flourishing. <laughs> um, that being said, I'd like to introduce you to Lindsay Telford. Lindsay is my partner uh, and co-facilitator and co-designer in this series. And Lindsay will tell you a little bit about her background. And then um, the other thing I'd like to acknowledge as well too, we can't get to this work without a lot of support, uh, particularly from our faculty at OCAD um, and particularly from our ecosystem here at Georgian. Um, but I would like to uh, acknowledge that Dr. Peter Jones was uh, our facilitator in some of this research and an immense support to this. He's on the line today as well. So I wanted to acknowledge that as well as Kathy Lang and Mary Ferguson, who were our advisors um, as well in this project. So Lindsay, over to you and introductions. Hi everyone, it's great to be here um, and great to virtually see you all. Um, as I said earlier, I'm joining you from Aurelia, Ontario. Um, and I come with, uh, I guess I come to this conversation with several decades of experience in nonprofit management uh, and coming at the social enterprise lens from uh, a nonprofit world and charitable lens and uh, working and, and for the last eight years I've actually been working on a national initiative called the Canadian Freshwater Alliance where we support the, um, the development of a united and uh, supported uh, constituency of freshwater champions to um, ensure that our waters are in good health. Uh, but I come at that lens very much from a capacity building standpoint and as, as my work in the nonprofit world uh, has evolved over the years, I think one of the challenges we continuously create is how a nonprofit world undervalues its services in, um, in our communities and, and, and to our world. And so I came at the conversation of social enterprise really from that, from, from that lens and how can we as charities, um, nonprofit champions of change uh, really, um, more effectively value um, the work that we do and the contribution that that makes to a flourishing community. Um, and, uh, and so I, I started uh, exploring business model canvases through that work and how we can support nonprofit communities to, um, to, to, to flourish um, as well within, within their efforts. Um, and a couple of years ago, uh, um, 
and began to engage with the with Georgian College. Um, that began with the Henry Burnick Entrepreneurship Center, where I still act as a social enterprise mentor, um, and um, and then shortly thereafter with the Social Enterprise Network of Central Ontario and the Center for Change Making and Social Innovation. So this has really become a hub um, in in Georgian College and really linking some of the traditional business uh, planning and development um, through the Henry Burnick Center um, with the social enterprise um, network and the Center for Social Innovation. So bringing all of those worlds together, as well as the nonprofit world, which, which I stem from, uh, has been an, an, exciting, an exciting time. And, and we're excited to share with you the methodology behind some of the workshop series that we've been developing using Flourishing really as our, as our centerpiece. And maybe I'll also say in there that I have been um, using Flourishing with my social enterprise clients through Georgian, um, both through the Henry Burnick Center and through um, Senco uh, to explore and deepen the understanding of, of the social enterprises that uh, my clients are looking to launch. Yeah, so that's the adventure we're about to go on tonight with everybody. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about how did Georgian end up with Flourishing? Um, as well, to answer your question, Anthony. Um, so in terms of our overview tonight, this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to talk to you about the introduction to SENCO, which again, stands for the Social Enterprise Network of Central Ontario. Um, it being uh, at Georgian and academia, uh, we have a lot of acronyms. Um, I remember when I got hired at Georgian for the first time, I, I didn't actually even know if I had an offer because there were so many acronyms in my offer letter. Um, I always thought that was kind of funny. Um, but uh, yeah, so then our approach, as Lindsay talked about, the design process that we went through, um, and this was sort of helped uh, in a large part uh, by the work with Peter um, and his brilliance, um, the framework to the curriculum and what we've learned to date. So uh, what you're looking at is actually something that was designed uh, over the summer of 2018 and is currently in, we're about halfway through this, this curriculum. So we do have some initial insights, and in fact, uh, next, uh, tomorrow night, we start our, our series, uh, we start our next series in this. So um, let's talk a little bit about what this is. So what is Senco? Well, Senco is essentially, um, it's at the Center for Change Making Social Innovation at Georgian College. It is uh, an initiative of the center. Um, so it, it inspires, connects, and equips those looking to engage in social enterprise to face cultural, environmental, and social challenges in our region. And as you can see here on the right, um, I think I got that right, um, this is our region. Uh, it's uh, sort of at the bottom of Georgian Bay and sort of nestled between Lake Simcoe. For those of you who might cottage up here, uh, this is um, this is our this is our uh, crib or our, our zone. Um, you know, we and these are the seven campuses that you see here um, that Georgian. So Georgian does have seven campuses across this region. Our you know our most southern is Orangeville. Our, our furthest here is. Um, Bracebridge. Um, and uh, of course, there's uh, various programs across these. Um, uh, the Community Impact Lab, uh, where I facilitate in, is in Aurelia, but our hub is the main campus in Barrie. So, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, the other thing to note is how did uh, Georgian College end up in this flourishing world? Well, uh, in 2018, uh, last year, Georgian was indoctrinated into the Ashoka U Changemaker Campus world. We are the first Canadian college to get this designation. This was led by our uh, director, uh, Susie addison Tour, uh, who had the vision to recognize that, um, you know, business and community had to work uh, together. Um, and it was only natural as we were sort of building out Senco, the vision for, for this entity, um, that we started to uh, examine, you know, what sort of, um, business model canvas or what sort of social enterprises we wanted to look at. So, uh, you know, Ellie, who is our program manager over at Senco, had been speaking with Pillar and said the flourishing business model canvas was the way to go. Uh, at that point in time, uh, we, we didn't really understand sort of what flourishing was, but one of the great things about it was we were about to go on this journey. And, and part of this is what you're about to see is our journey into flourishing and the, what we sort of have decided to work through on this. So, uh, oh, oh dear, uh, Sanko's theory of change. Uh, so you see it's already a shift disturber right there. It's gone around here. Uh, so this is essentially in a nutshell, uh, Sanko's theory of change. Uh, why this is important uh, for this conversation this evening is because you're going to see uh, what Lindsay and I had to sort of work within in terms of, you know, sort of look 
looking at the flourishing business model canvas, identifying the ecosystem that we were going into, and the obviously the benchmarks and the KPIs that we were to 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 build this to. Because here's the thing: uh, the reason why this exists is because we uh, Senko was awarded um, six hundred fifty thousand um, dollars in grants to help develop a rural social enterprise in our area. So um, when you think of Central Ontario. Um, you know, the concept of central Ontario being sort of north of, you know, sort of Durham and Highway 7 um, and, and into sort of up into Muskoka, that's really sort of in a provincial context. It sort of comes across that band. Um, and, uh, and a lot of times we get lumped into a lot of the Toronto conversation. And what we recognize is that while, while, while that's very important, there are some complexities in our area where we're not completely uh, urban and we're not completely rural, but we're more rural than we are urban. And um, Lindsay can attest to some of this um, in terms of some of the work she does uh, in her organization with the Canadian Freshwater Alliance. And uh, they, they, they require sort of a, um, an ability to, to be a little bit more ambidextrous in our thinking around this. So essentially, uh, Senko's theory of change was to see, stemming from Georgian being the hub for that, was looking at both individuals and organizations that were looking at uh, revenue diversification right through to social purpose um, to the community and how are we connecting people in the community to some of these um, you know, burgeoning ideas of social enterprise. Lindsay, do you want to add anything to, to this theory of change um, as well? As a believer? No, I, I, mean, I, th I think that I think that you've covered it well, Nicole. I think that um, what what I would probably just reemphasize is the focus of exploring how we achieve this type of systemic change within a, you know, a relatively spread out rural community um, with, with a not intense population um, development yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's encroaching on us. So that leads us to this conversation about flourishing as we were looking to build out this ecosystem. Yeah. Um, we actually were we actually kind of had we ended up with a sort of um, curriculum crush on this little chart here. Um, this idea that um, the conversation between weak and, and strong and sustainable. So you have to understand sort of coming into our area, um, there's a lot of manufacturing, there's a lot of small to medium sized uh, enterprise, um, uh, and there's a lot of, um, there's been a lot of change that has happened in sort of the Barrie area. Barrie was once known as a very strong manufacturing area. Um, it's a very big, strong, conservative uh, in terms of politically, it's, it's a conservative stronghold. It's been conservative probably as long as I've been alive, which is a long time now. Um, so you've got to understand that sort of bringing this conversation to the fold, um, is particularly even when we were talking with our nonprofit um, partners, was this idea that they didn't really understand what it meant to sort of develop a, a flourishing or a holistic vision um, around their business model. I mean, they really still saw themselves as, you know, sort of doing the work, but, you know, trying to figure out, well, I have to make money, but that's sort of contrary to my mission. So we found that we have a lot of those conversations about pushing them to sort of saying, you know, okay, here's this idea of the, of the profit normative bolt on that you're trying to build into your, to your organizations. But you know, really, where we're going is over here and flourishing, and um, you know, and 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 I sort of love this this opening that uh, Anthony was uh, and Peter had um, in 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 their paper was this idea of the definition of a strong sustainable firm. We define if if it were to exist, which I love that bracket. If it were to exist, an organization that only uh, enabled strongly sustainable outcomes as one that creates positive environmental, social, and economic value through its value network thereby sustaining the possibility that human and other life can flourish on this planet forever. And I think uh, for us, as we were sort of investigating that from an academic institution, but also really understanding like, we have to be able to, to break this down to individuals who are just like, you know, we just need revenue diversification. You know, just talk to us about revenue diversification. Um, our organizations need this. And Lindsay, maybe you can speak to that a little bit more because you're a little bit more frontline and sort of the mentorship of some of these things that we were starting to overcome as we started to talk about what is flourishing and what is sustainability 
Um, and, and this really drove us to talk about how are we going to, how are we going to teach this or how are we going to break this down uh, for our community to really understand and make an impact in the ecosystem. So one of the things that, uh, that we continue to find with our students, our clients, the social enterprise community, or the business startup community in our area is they come at us with very specific interests. Um, like I think Nicole referenced, in, in many cases in the charitable world, it's we need revenue diversification. Um, or in the corporate startup world, it is, um, it is really about, um, you know, I have this great pro, you know, I have this great product or idea that we want to bring to market. And so we were started to play around with how we could start to introduce concepts of the strongly sustainable business uh, into these conversations to challenge some of these groups, organizations, entities to really think about a bigger picture. Uh, and um, I, again, as I think Nicole uh, spoke of earlier, we, we sort of landed on flourishing and some of the questions that are exposed when using the flourishing business model canvas to really start to, to expose um, some of that, uh, you know, some of that thinking and, and challenge our enterprises to really contextualize themselves in their, um, in their enterprise within our broader community within this region. Um, I would say that a vast majority of them are really excited about that potential. Um, and, and then I think as we, as we'll show through some of our methodology, we're starting to explore how we, um, how we continue the journey with those who are kind of like, ah, actually, we're really only interested in revenue diversification, or really, I'm not interested in thinking about my enterprise within a broader community makeup. And how can we keep, um, keep that conversation alive for some of those participants, bring them along in a journey, um, and or let them, let them go, <laughs> um, as the case may be in, in some circumstances. So, so yeah, so, so, so that, and that's a key point that we recognize that, you know, if we're going to throw the modeling tool up, a couple things that are going to happen. Um, one, this is going to become the DNA of our ecosystem. And while that seems sort of, okay, well, yeah, if that's the tool you're going to use to build these businesses and you're supposed to reach 7,000 individuals and we have to have sort of, you know, X amount of social enterprises by 2020, you know, the question starts to become now, it becomes a system conversation um, because not only are we having these conversations about flourishing and sort of they're going through the workshops and some are, may or may not end up going through the entire workshop and building out the, the model, this idea that we've started this conversation about flourishing, uh, we started to really think deeply about that and, and the DNA that, that that's really going to start to put into to the ecosystem. Um, you know, and this idea that, you know, the biggest idea for us was this conversation about, you know, in business, we talk about stakeholders and stuff. But really now, if we're, we're having the conversation about uh, flourishing, we're talking about ecosystem actors. And this was sort of one of the biggest takeaways that we did was, you know, sort of language. And, and, and I think, you know, Lean for Flourishing really started to, you know, and, and what was so great about the work that Andine was showing with us is that idea that, you know, there has to be built a competency for flourishing. Um, and I think we intuitively kind of, you know, sort of said, okay, and then, you know, Lean for Flourishing has really built that out. So we sort of stumbled on upon this in some weird way. And um, what's great about connecting with this community and sort of working with is saying, like, we're uncovering some of these same things um, and, and shifting language, uh, particularly in this area has been, and even at Georgian, when we talk about change making and social innovation, is a huge topic um, in order to have. And, and we recognize that this was going to be a, a big key in this because 70 social enterprises, et cetera, by 2020, our awareness of impact is that if we're using the flourishing business model canvas to build social enterprise, we'll have ripple effects to our region in terms of people, planet, and profit because they will be built as flourishing social enterprises. And then we'll be influencing a region through strongly sustainable firms to build a flourishing, uh, flourishing rural ecology um, which then as Peter, as he was working with us on this identified, you know, this is where the conversations eventually down the road of a policy canvas start to come in. So, so that we had this sort of huge journey as we sort of explored through this when really, you know, um, ultimately, uh, uh, what we were asked to do <laughs> was create 
a sessional uh, social enterprise sessional framework, but we realized it wasn't going to be just like, okay, here's a, you know, here's the flourishing business model canvas and let's carve it up. And this is what stakeholders are. And this is like that conversation. We recognized we were, we were, we weren't going to be integrous um, to not only the tool we were using to the concept of flourishing to the, to the academic research that was being done. And also to like the people in our region um, and the ecosystems in our region. Um, you know, if we truly are a social purpose business, I think we have to, def we had to, we had to really ask the question of how we had to broaden that conversation about who's included in that, that purpose and who's social um, and recognize that there's not so many delineations as there are overlaps. So just Nicole, Nicole, yeah. before yeah. you go on, um, well, one question uh, I'm, I'm really curious about when you, so, so if you go back to your theory of change, really there's, uh, sure. there's now another part to the, to the right of, of social. Oh, sorry, hold on. I'm back. Oh my God. Sorry. How do I get back? Um, there right we go. Now, maybe. There it is. Oh, there, okay. Okay. Sorry. I just, uh, apparently I'm arrow, um, arrow incompetent at the moment. <laughs> yeah. So if you go back to the theory of change a second, if you can. Yeah. Let me just, uh, come on arrows. Sorry. Um, here. Why isn't this, uh, why isn't this moving back? Nope. That, nope, that's forward. Okay. Okay, so this is... So on, okay, well, just imagine it. So uh, on, on the theory of change, you, you, the right-hand side, the, 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 the uh, ultimate thing that that theory of change said was you're trying to get to creating social enterprises, Georgian enabling that with community and with others to create those social enterprises. But, and then I think what I've understood you to say, and I just want to confirm this, that, the, that now, in fact, there's a, there's a step beyond that because actually you're seeing that creating social enterprises isn't your ultimate purpose. Your ultimate purpose is actually ensuring that those social enterprises are going to contribute to a flourishing community economically, socially, and environmentally. So also, I should say socially, environmentally, and economically. Yeah. Um, is that correct? But that's what, that that's, presenting this today, you might update this slide to include that on the right-hand side. Right, so when we show you our map, so we have a big map we're gonna show you today too, which actually encompasses this. So this is sort of the setup. So, but you're absolutely right, Anthony, this is, these are the realizations um, that we were starting to come into was just this idea that, you know, like we have to take it, we have to be accountable um, for some of the tools and, and methodologies that we're going to be using and how might that affect down the road. And it's all fine and well and dandy to build a flourishing enterprise, but if you send them into a non-flourishing ecosystem, economically or politically, like how are we doing justice to the traction of the flourishing conversation? Um, so it just it just kind of started to unravel all of these conversations that we ended up in. And and you're right, like I think it was really the conversation was, you know, we have to kind of put we kind of have to be who we say we're going to be. And if we're going to put a theory of change out there where we're going to enable and equip, aspire and sustainable, that's not a, that's not a, that's not a, you know, here's how you build your social enterprise. That's an ecosystem conversation, right? So the, the, sorry. Sorry, let me add a follow up and then Lisa, I, I'm very interested in your response as well. Um, the the follow up is what has been the reaction of Georgian College's stakeholders to this? And the reason I'm asking the question is we've got quite a few members across Canada and elsewhere who have attempted to do what you've done um, have, when they've, when they've shared it with their stakeholders, they've not got support from their stakeholders, but you seem to have managed to get support from, from Georgian College's internal management and also from people like Ashoka, who, who theoretically ought to be interested in this, but historically when we've had other people try this, it hasn't worked, uh, and others as well. So I'm really curious to hear, hear Lindsay, your perspective on, on both of that. Well, I might let Nicole jump in on the on the Georgian stakeholders. I have the benefit of not being as embedded within um, the the Georgian infrastructure as as Nicole, but I did want to jump in and provide the uh, an example that I think might um, display how this is starting to play out. And we're in the very early phases of this, so 
Um, so I, I think we'll have much more to share in a couple of years when we have a few years under our belt. But, you know, one example of how this is, um, is uh, exploding, let's say, with, um, with one client that I've been working with, and that's um, a client who is starting, has been running a kombucha company in Collingwood, and she ferments her own um, drinks and has, has been building quite a client base. And through using the, the Flourishing Canvas and starting to think about her ecosystem, she is uh, really wanting to prioritize the sourcing of her um, ingredients from local sources, though she's having some trouble um, finding local, enough local honey or enough local blueberries or, um, you know, a, enough local uh, lavender, other, other products that she uses within the kombucha varieties. And so now all of a sudden we've started um, dialogues with um, producers in the region to talk about how we can um, sustainably develop some of these products so that we can source uh, the ingredients from local providers um, using sustainable me methods of, of production. Um, and so all of a sudden, what was one social enterprise wanting to start a kombucha company has evolved into a social enterprise landscape because we need the other providers to feed into the one social enterprise. Um, now that's very early stages. And so she's talking about, okay, well, what are some interim measures? Can I get you know, organic local or wild blueberries from, a, you know, a neighboring bioregion in the interim while we're building up um, a product. But we're, you know, so we're exploring some of those complexities of what do you do when your local ecosystem just can't immediately provide for you. Um, but it is, it's so, it's such an interesting case study and, um, and how just the startup of one social enterprise can really blossom a whole community conversation. Yeah. And now and now now back to your question on stakeholder on stakeholders. I think maybe because we are in the early phase, um, you know, I, I I and there's been some excitement around it. I, I think that there is a willingness to embrace and and then I also think and and I suspect Nicole will um, give a shout out to Susie Addison Tour who um, really has been as a as a leader in Georgian. Um, really putting her support behind this initiative and um, and being really uh, successful at, at garnering the support of others. Yeah. So Susie, our director, uh, has been amazing at this. This is essentially, in a lot of ways, her vision. Um, Susie was pivotal in bringing Ashoka to Georgian, uh, which uh, earned us a lot of credibility because what the Ashoka designation did is in order to get that designation, Ashoka examines the institutions from a systemic level. So it's so you can apply to be an Ashoka Changemaker campus, but it's a two-year process in which an audit you go through. And so as part of that designation, um, you also have to provide to Ashoka what are your plans in terms of systemic change making. Um, and again, this brings in the flourishing conversation was, so if that's a showcase definition of change making, one of the questions that we were asking here is, you know, what is, what does that mean for our reason? So what's our flavor of change making? And how are we going to approach change making from our perspective, having the unique diversity of being in a rural region um, and in, you know, sort of having that deep uh, reliance on our supply chain to, um, you know, our watersheds, our agricultural, um, even our transportation systems uh, and roads here. Um, so, you know, sort of just the geography alone defines a little bit of that. And Jordan recognizes that in a lot of ways because it's, you know, it's, it's dappled throughout um, the region. And Jordan also recognizes too that you know, as, as a contributing member, just by the nature of being a college, you know, a college's connection to the community is essentially mandated in its sort of DNA. You know, the whole reason for the college uh, system in Canada was that applied knowledge. So we're measured on many things around how do the things that we are doing, how are they actually contributing and, and putting applied knowledge back into the communities, particularly in workforce development, particularly um, in, in economic development. So I think for us, um, in terms of stakeholders at Georgian, the idea of social enterprise is, is just part of the agenda. Like I, I just think it's for them, and, and again, Susie's ability to host conversations and bring people together and really have that within the organization. So maybe someday she'll sit down and write a book about how she did that, because I think we would all benefit <laughs> in a lot of ways. So um, 
sorry, that was a little bit of a, hopefully that answered some questions. Um, and, uh, and anyways, uh, cool. Are there any other questions that anybody has? Uh, no? Okay, cool. So, so I just want to get into the brass tacks. Hopefully everybody's still awake. Uh, uh, okay. Um, so here's the brass tacks of what we had to do uh, based upon this grant that we had received and what we were asked to do was to design and build a multiple stakeholder workshop sessions that would run as a series each semester. Um, as you know, we are an academic institution, so we speak in semesters, even though our community may not, um, but that's another conversation we've been having. Um, and we had to use or partner existing research such as the Blourishing Business Model Canvas and courses from the Social Enterprise Institute. I'm not sure if anybody uh, is familiar with the Social Enterprise Institute, uh, but they are on an online learning platform. They have a lot of great courses and we've been using it. And then Nicole and Lindsay got into the mix because that's just what we do. And we wanted to make the best client social enterprise build out experience and offer an approach no one else currently has. Um, so that was the Nicole and Lindsay secret sauce. And uh, both Nicole, uh, myself and Lindsay, I think are a little bit on the perfectionist side. And if you're gonna put us on a project, um, you just gotta get ready for the ride. Um, so, um, so that led us to this. Um, this is kind of uh, one of our preliminary conversations about what would a curriculum look like. So this was many of uh, many whiteboards. This whiteboard got very busy. It got even more busier after that. Um, and maybe Peter, uh, if he if he's still uh, here, he he would be excited to know that we actually uh, used uh, one of his lectures and his learnings <laughs> to sort of fill this out. So this is the preliminary curriculum that led us to essentially. Um, identify the sessional foundation for the framework. So we identified Everson and Deverly's service design process because we recognized that what we were building out in terms of pulling apart the business model canvas, but more importantly, pulling apart flourishing um, and its sort of context was really indicative of this uh, service delivery framework. And we, after sort of we, uh, after spending a lot of time doing that, we sort of did our lit review and we recognized that really this was a service uh, to our um, this was a service to our ecosystem that we were providing. And if we treated it as such, um, perhaps as opposed to um, building out product offerings in terms of a workshop, we were actually building out service offerings. Um, and that's sort of how we started to do it. And as you can see here, we embedded sort of an action research oriented for the participants. It, um, we took a lot of time to build in reflection um, and it allows us to leverage design thinking methods and processes and also integrate the feasibility via the failure process. Um, for Lindsay and I, this was a really big topic of conversation was how do we build the ability to allow our participants as they're exploring flourishing and building out their business model, the ability and space to fail. Um, we called it the honesty loop originally, um, where this idea that as we're working with our participants, um, that we could get brutally honest with them in terms of the viability and feasibility conversation, um, which is currently what we're working on right now. Um, and we can speak a little bit more to that in a minute. Um, but what we want to do now is we want to walk you through our map. Um, so this might uh, be interesting for you guys. Um, so our curriculum was actually built out into a giga map. So for those of you who may or may not be familiar with some of the uh, work that OCAD does in terms of uh, its curriculum for the Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program, um, Jeremy Bowes and Peter Jones have done a lot of work with this concept of visualization through giga maps and, and, and systems maps or synthesis maps. Um, they've actually uh, published, um, and I can actually provide that link as well later, um, uh, particularly to Sheji, um, an excellent uh, article about how this is starting to inform complex systems and how to illustrate that. So uh, we're going to take you on a little adventure now. So I'm just going to unshare my screen for a sec. Um, I'm just going to get out of this and I'm going to pull this up. Is everybody still still good? Yeah. All right. This this is the ride, so get ready. <laughs> Here's the ride. Okay. So I'm gonna. So here we go. Um, full screen mode. So this is really the this is really the conversation we've been talking to you about um, in terms of uh, the PowerPoint presentation. So. If people want to noodle into this, this is on the Google Drive uh, right now, um, and. If you want me to go in a little bit closer to this, uh, please let me know. Uh, just basically say, cool, zoom in. Um, we're just going to free flow this a little bit if that's okay with everybody. But this essentially, so if I zoom out uh, or try to zoom out, um, it's not really, hold on. 
there, that's why. So here is the map in its entirety. Uh, basically, if you're reading left to right, you see the theory of change, uh, sorry, on the left, sorry, left, yeah, on the left, um, I'm really bad with left and right, I apologize. Um, uh, on the left here, we start with the theory of change, and this sort of documents all the way through, um, all the way through right through to sort of a panarchy understanding of the ecosystem and the policy canvas. Um, you know, and sort of in the middle is the curriculum and how that flows and works and some of the loops. Um, and then on the bottom is some of the sessional framework that we've been building out. This map, I would say right now is about, because we're in the process of sort of testing and building this as we go along, this map is probably about, I would say 75% complete. Um, we're just moving into the blue zone at the bottom here in terms of our workshops. So uh, let's, uh, let's take a look. So as you mentioned before, uh, this is the sessional uh, framework. So Senko's theory of change uh, has is sort of is how we start this map. Uh, we identify uh, we identify this, and we've talked a little bit about this. Um, this is just a little bit more of a breakout um, in terms of uh, where Senko sees itself, essentially uh, applying itself, and how it's working in sort of this divergence to convergence, and where these sessional frameworks are fitting in. Um, and sort of the prepared and equipped uh, aspect of the theory of change. Again, um, you can read, there, there's actually the theory, uh, Senko's theory of change is actually on the Google Drive as well. So if you want to spend some time as well afterwards and, and, and read a little bit more, we have put all that information up for you uh, to really take a look at. Um, the other thing too is, so where did we start? Um, and maybe Lindsay, you can speak to this part about it because I think this was really our biggest starting point in terms of uh, what we identified as to, you know, okay, how are we going to build this? Um, so maybe Lindsay, you can talk to some of the mental models um, and where we started because we believe this was sort of key in informing our entire build. Um, and I'm going to let Lindsay talk a little bit about this because uh, Lindsay's connection frontline is a little bit deeper than mine and she can speak to some of how we ended up with these mental models. Yeah, so one of the places we started was, uh, was developing uh, these mental models, which were really personas in many respects of many of the clients that I had been starting to see and see trends in um, through my work with the uh, Henry Burnick Entrepreneurship Center and, um, and Senco. And, and, and so we grouped those personas, those mental models into um, the, the five categories that you see here. I would probably say that this isn't necessarily exhaustive. In fact, it, I don't think it's exhaustive, but I think it, it, it showed uh, five key trends that we were seeing and the questions that people were asking and why they were coming to um, Georgian for um, mentorship, coaching, support, and their social enterprise startups. Um, first and foremost, it was legal questions. They needed, they wanted to know the, the legal specifics of starting a social enterprise. Um, how do you incorporate? Uh, do you incorporate it as a business or a not-for-profit and, and, or a co-op? And, and what do any of those models mean? Um, we had people coming wondering if they actually have what it takes to start a social enterprise. Some of them weren't wondering that, but I think it's a good question <laughs> for them to, um, to reflect and consider. Um, many of them were just looking for resources. They wanted funding. They wanted to know if I had the magic money tree in my backyard that I could fund their social enterprise. Um, many of them were looking for business model designs. Um, and some of them were just looking to build up their own skills um, around uh, starting social enterprise. And so there were these different mental models that we were seeing very common trends in. Um, and so we took those mental models um, and, and as we'll explore through the next phase, worked them through some loops of how can we design the series so that people will get some of the practical tools that they're looking for, but that through getting those practical tools, we can kind of blow their mind open to other concepts that are um, critical for them and to think about and in, in, in venturing down this path of, of the social enterprise startup. Right. So, and so we, 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 thought, we thought this was really important um, because we needed to, you know, sort of start where people were at and recognize that not everybody was coming into this build uh, from the same uh, perspective. And we were about to, to sort of, like, as we mentioned before, we were about to sort of shock their world with this canvas. 
Um, and the other question was is, so when do we get them to the canvas? When do we introduce the canvas to them? And how do we steep them into this concept of flourishing through to actually building into something that is sort of viable, feasible, and desirable um, um, and with this? So, so all these crazy things that you're seeing on here was this idea that, um, first of all, if from my experience up in uh, working with the students, was really had a really great, um, rich sort of insights as to how to work um, collaboratively to, to alongside and sort of, um, you know, the design thinking sort of, you know, show, not tell. Um, so we decided to, instead of making it a, a classroom where you came in and sat, what we would do is we would, we would use the Social uh, Enterprise Institute's curriculum and we would align um, with the legal, the self efficacy the mental models, we would align, these are what these dots are that sort of go around. I don't know if anybody can see my pointer. Um, I don't know if that's the case. Oh yeah, you can, okay, cool. So here, um, uh, the, we aligned the, the anywhere, so basically curriculum, so information, and we sort of surrounded them with this idea that, you know, at this stage, people would be seeking, and so we would, we would surround these collabs, so the sessional framework where we brought everybody together to do the work, instead of asking them to sort of sit through and, and give the lecture, we would actually have a maker space. Um, and so the idea would be is we would work through, um, and then what we would require them to do is, on their own time, uh, work through the curriculum. Um, and what we were finding was, so the first, the first stage in this was this concept of what we called series one. And in series one, this, as you can see here at the bottom, this is sort of the action uh, research sort of reflection stage that we would take them through in terms of just the framework. Um, and it would, it, and, and we would then evaluate, um, you know, sort of seeking, articulating and feasibility. And so each one of these would be sort of a weekly session that would be four hours. And in those four hours, these would sort of be the zones that we would work through. So we talk about frame, prototype, activity, evaluate, and the ability to reflect. But in this idea back up here was uh, we would take them through these loops. And these spiraling loops where they would continually iterate, you know, just sort of in the design thinking methodology, they would sort of start to iterate. Uh, really be part of that. Um, and then we called this, what we did, what we, we started to do was call this thing the honesty loop. Um, and the honesty loop was really about, let's really get honest about this thing you want to build or this idea that you have. And one of the things that um, I've known for is the brutally honest conversation of, okay, the only person who's going to be more in love with your idea or, or your vision is going to be you tomorrow. So how do we get really honest about what you're building here and aligning it to the strong sustainability and the flourishing because we're taking it pretty seriously that you're going to, you're going to contribute to the ecosystem in some way, which leads us to this idea. And so this was just sort of our sort of work through of, you know, IDA defining failure, feasibility, measure to sustainability. Yes, no. But the most important part of this, uh, this thing that we're talking about is this guy right here, this thing called the drop zone. And Lindsay, why don't you talk a little bit about this? Because this was sort of, you know, we both agreed that this is really, really important uh, in this process is that we identified as we moved through this and we were sort of contextualizing a bit more like a movement framework is it's all fun and well and dandy if we've got the people in the program. But what we really want to do is we want to talk more about the people that fall out of the program. And if this is truly an ecosystem conversation, what happens to those people that don't stay in this curriculum or don't stay in the session? What do we do with them now? So part of this whole sort of crazy ass graph we've gone through and these feedback loops and all this kind of stuff was what happens to those who don't make it through this? What happens then? Where do these people go? Because, you know, that's an opportunity lost to bring flourishing in, in another context. So again, I'll pop this over to Lindsay. So Lindsay, why don't you talk a little bit about this because you're the, you know, you're sort of this expert in, in this area in terms of, you know, your ability to sort of uh, mobilize and, and bring people together. So, Nicole, are you, are you talk, when you say drop zone, you're thinking as in parachute, parachute drop zone. That I'm thinking like they drop off. They, 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 we lose them, right? Because oh, they I, I was wondering, are you, are you planning to pack a parachute for them? I mean, that's not, not what typically happens in entrepreneurial programs like this, right? If you fail yes, the test, you get pushed out the door without a parachute. Bingo. So this, yeah, so no, it's true. It's true. So this is what we, so this is what we decided. And this is really where Georgian 
can really contribute to this conversation of let's, okay, so, so what? You don't want to build a flourishing enterprise? Great, no problem. Here's your parachute. We're going to shove you over here and we'll show you a little bit deeper. So, so, so Lindsay, why don't you talk a little bit about this and I'm going to get this map to kind of expand a bit and yeah. then you talk about what happens in the drop zone. So there, I, I guess there was two kind of realisms that we were trying to uh, we were challenging ourselves to think about. And one was these are workshop series, right? So we just finished a, th a, a three part, two, three part workshop series for um, the sort of the, the series one. Uh, and we're going into series two. And so uh, th it's a natural drop zone. We're going to lose people. There we're going to have people who came to series one who aren't going to come to series two. And subsequently, we're going to have people from series two who aren't going to come to series three. Now, interestingly enough, we have um, an 80% return rate, I think, from series one to series two happening. So we're, 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 just, we're holding people pretty good. Um, but what do we do with those people who fall off? Um, and I think that it's, and that's what we were calling the drop zone. There's going to be various reasons why they're going to drop out. One might be their, um, they, they're, they're not buying the, the methodology or approach. Uh, and so do we have a place for those people to go? Um, maybe they're not ready to embrace the flourishing concept. You know, let, let's be honest, some people aren't going to be ready to embrace it. Um, and so then we were like, are there places where we can, where we can refer these people so that they don't get dropped completely? Um, and, you know, one place that we can refer them to within Georgian's landscape is the Henry Burnick Entrepreneurship Center, which does run very similar series to what we're running within a very traditional business approach. Um, so I shouldn't say similar. They run, ser they run a, a business development series uh, within a very traditional business approach. Now, interestingly enough, I have been starting to go and talk to that series about social enterprise and flourishing social enterprise development. And um, I'm getting a lot of pickup <laughs> in those series as well. So I think we might start to see some of, some of them come our way as well. But there is a place where they can go, where they can get a very traditional business approach that we're still infiltrating and challenging them to, to think in a, in a broader term. Um, so that's one place that they can go. And an, an, another place might be, a, a, another thing that might happen is in our, in our ideation and prototyping series, maybe they'll actually find that their business idea isn't going to flourish. <laughs> um, and so it was an important, it, it was an important component that we really wanted to work into this. Does every idea have to manifest itself into uh, um, an acting social enterprise? And, and we both came from the idea, no, <laughs> or the answer, no. And in fact, part, it is incumbent upon us in teaching a flourishing approach to actually challenge people if we don't actually think their idea is going to flourish. Um, and this is hard, I think, within a, a, a business startup, social enterprise support world, because we want everybody to succeed, right? We want everyone to succeed in their ideas. Um, but let's be honest, some might not actually, some won't, some won't succeed, and they won't succeed for various reasons. And one of those reasons is um, they didn't prove there's not, there, it's not feasible. Yeah, um, and, and so as we work through that, we wanted to really embed those drop zones to challenge ourselves as instructors, facilitators, coaches, mentors, um, to be honest about that. And that's the other reason why the honesty loop came into play. And the others was to challenge our clients to be honest um, with the uh, applicability, the the um, the the realism, the feasibility of their studies or of their enterprise ideas. And also you got to understand too, like the majority of people that are coming into our workshops, they're not um, like the typical entrepreneur that's coming in. It's not the tech company that's like, you know, I've got the next best app or I've got the next best, you know, widget. The, the, the people that are coming in are nonprofits that need revenue diversification. There may be people who, you know, they, they, they're passionate. Like we've had one person come in and, you know, like they, they want to tackle the plastic economy. It's like nobody in the household should be using plastic pieces. So I'm designing these, you know, different ways in which we can use like wrap and fabric and stuff right um to a landscape company who is like recognizing that you know what we're not just a landscaper we're at the point of contact where we could actually protect watersheds along our you know high-end luxury customers that you know border on the lake um but all these people like you say like you know some of them might have a social enterprise 
maybe they have a program that could go into an existing not-for-profit. You know, so we really had to really be cognizant of that because there's a place for, like if we, if we take the true flourishing concept, there's a place for everybody in the ecosystem, but then isn't it our responsibility to help navigate that a little bit? And, and so on this map, when you see this arrow to the drop zone, this actually is a really cool sort of little chart thing that we sort of, um, uh, innovation hub in Ottawa gave to us and said, well, this is how we, and they've, they've uncovered some of these same things where, you know, where do people go? Like they might not be ready for a social enterprise. And maybe, the, maybe what we need to do is create this little chart that when the intake people are talking to them, you know, they can point to where they need to go. And we were like, that's awesome in the area. I'm like, that would be something that we would then, our drop zones would want to inform. So instead of saying it's social enterprise support guide, Ottawa, we would eventually have a social enterprise support, you know, sort of, uh, you know, the region of central Ontario and sort of starting to build that out. But we don't know that yet because we haven't pushed enough these through through Senko to say, here's where all the drop zones. So these, I, these purple things that we have on our chart here are just identifications of where we think drop zones might happen and then in that drop zone what do you think what where do you think we need to push them in terms of, of, of the sort of the flourishing ecosystem so these are some of the things as we move sort of closer to the the right side of the map these are sort of things we're not we're just kind of in theory right now and as you can see here in our drop zones we sort of identified the movement pyramid the, the movement framework where you know like in terms of our drop zones will we be able to identify people who don't make it through the program um, you know, like, how are they like, we have a social enterprise one on one, we have series two, you know, series one, series two, series three, applying for funding and launching and leading. So there's some areas in here where we're really starting to, to explore and build out. But ultimately, the end goal is, if to build this new mental model of any people that have come through our series or, or worked with us is the new mental model of the flourishing social entrepreneur. Right, so it's not just the social entrepreneur, but it's the flourishing social entrepreneur. And these were some of the things where we talked about, and you'll see these little purple things where we talk about resiliency loops, where we're starting to say like, okay, so where do drop zones happen, but where are there opportunities where we can build ecosystem resiliency? You know, and so where are these sort of, these pivotal points? And this is what this map was trying to figure out for us was, you know, where are all these things, where are all these potential of these things? Um, happening and then as we push into the ecosystem the ecosystem conversation here where we we started to explore panarchy loops where you know we've got individuals and orgs that then shift into to networks and communities right that are leveraging their social enterprises right through into sort of the flourishing ecosystem and economic development so local economies and then what does that do now to our um, you know our members of municipal government and policymakers like, holy crap, we've got all these people out here trying to talk about, um, you know, flourishing and strong sustainability. But, you know, our, our policies and our, our ways and our bylaws are not aligning with that. So now what do we do? Um, so, you know, this is sort of we see that as we go through this over the next two to three years, these are some of the conversations where, you know, maybe Georgian in terms of workforce development and economic development starts to have to, you know, sort of look at their curriculum, look at their relationship in, in the community and take responsibility for the fact that we're pushing these people and these students and these organizations into our ecosystem. So how now are we going to be supporting that um, when we have a conversation with the mayors and the township, uh, you know, uh, local officials and our MPPs? Um, um, so those are some of the conversations that we had, and this is what this map and sort of how that informed some of the things we were doing. Um, so Lindsay, is there anything you want to add to that uh, or Good. questions? Hello? Maybe there's Lindsay. So, so Nicole, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, having, having heard this story now for the first time end to end, I've heard pieces of it before, but this, this is fantastic uh, a summary as is you know, uh, the whole point of the Giga map. So it's, it's uh, an, another proof point that the, uh, the approach works uh, from Peter's perspective. So I'm, what I'm curious about is, so why are you still using the term social enterprise? Uh, that's a really interesting question that you have asked. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I mean, so, so, so from, from some of the conversations we've had in this community over the last seven years, you know, all enterprises are social because they're made by people. So they have to be social, right? Like fundamentally. Um, and um, so a social enterprise is not anything special. 
which is the reason why everybody has such a hard time defining what a social enterprise is, because they all immediately run into this problem that actually a social enterprise isn't different from any other enterprise. Right. In most, most respects. So I, I think it, it boils down to rhetoric, to be honest, um, in terms of, um, you know, when you talk about innovation or you talk about business or you talk about these worlds that, you know, like you got to remember, um, I think it really just is about terminology and, and what people know. So right now, like for instance, in Georgian, um, if I've got two streams of choices to build my business, I can go to the Henry Burnick Entrepreneurship Center and build a, you know, an enter like, and be, and be an entrepreneur. Um, or I can go to Senko right now and I can build a social purpose. So I, I think it's more a delineation rather than, um, you know, from almost more of a, a navigation or a wayfinding for the, for the end users, as opposed to. And, and, and also you yeah. it causes you to self select people who are more likely to respond positively to the ideas, to, to the mental models that you're trying to promote. Right. Because these mental models are different from the mental models that they encounter in, in the traditional entrepreneurship program. Absolutely. And, you know, like Heidi Neck, you know, like some of her work where she talks about this idea of the entrepreneurship mental model, um, you know, sort of cognitive ambidexterity, right? Um, you know, when we think about it, though, it's like, yeah, like that, you know, it doesn't really matter whether you're building a social purpose business in quotations or not. <clears throat> the meant that that idea of being able to sort of contextualize and flip between sort of creation and prediction logic is super important um, in anything you do, whether you're an entrepreneur or entrepreneur, right? Um, but I, I think as as we go along, and I think I think it's really more about the, the the history of how business is taught, to be honest, right? And how like you know, the, these conversations have to sort of be put over into these new categories, if to be honest, more than anything, so that people can contextualize it, right? And I, and I might just say that I, I, I think, and, and I'm just sort of speculating, I think, on the answer to this, Anthony, but I, I think that we're probably using that terminology to try to create this space for us to have these conversations. Um, because I suspect, no, I, I, you know, I, I do work with the Henry Burnick Entrepreneurship Center. I think they're great. <laughs> they're lots of, they're great, intelligent, smart business people oh, yeah. who have not yet embraced, I, I think, what is our future way of organizing business in our communities. I think it needs to be, <laughs> to be blunt. Um, and I think that, you know, if I were to develop a, a theory of change, for our business at Georgian over the long term, I think at some point the Henry Burnick Entrepreneurship Center and, and Senco are going to have to merge because the reality is that's the way that business is going in the future. I, I, that being said, I don't think it's where we're at now. Um, and so there was a need for us to create the space to have these conversations um, in the way that we wanted to have those conversations and not to be um, maybe continuously um, trying to work them into the, the traditional entrepreneurship center. And yeah. uh, that being said, uh, the, I'm, I work at the, at the traditional entrepreneurship center as well. And uh, there is an increasing uh, resonance on these ideas and concepts. And so I think that we have to continue to marry um, that, that approach as we work through this over time. Yeah. And that's why I think it was so important for us to identify in a lot of ways that this was more of a conversation about a movement like how do you weave these ideas together in a way that, you know, you get your early adopters on board, you get your extreme users on board. And then, you know, when we get to the chasm where we have to sort of get critical mass, you know, that, the, that, that, that jump is sort of, it's okay. Do you know what I mean? Like it's not a threat, it's non-threatening. And it, and it, and it recognizes that, you know, like, like Lindsay said, like we need the smarts and the intelligence of, of that, you know, sort of business think, right but not necessarily and and we need that understanding of the sort of the that that more forward-looking under inclusion and the fact that you know alone you know they're strong but together they're even stronger right like the hybridization of this um creates even greater capacity um and and you know, just sort of being in the practicalness of it and also being in the georgian ecosystem you know there is a lot of conversation around like the silos right and how do we cross the silos like that's that transdisciplinary conversation you know that sort of is the foundation for the sfi program 
Um, and I, and I just think, you know, we, you know, it's, it's, it's a question where I think it's just about having a lot of conversations. And I think that's why, you know, our director has been so successful is really understanding, you know, sort of that appreciative inquiry and understanding where, and recognizing where people are at and then moving from there. Um, so, you know, so I think for us, oh, just, just uh, we're recognizing we're getting towards the end yeah. of time and Bob is curious to see what you've got to say about the canvas. So am I. Uh, and Andrew had a, a point he just wanted to make. Yeah, uh, sorry. Just a great response to the question about social enterprise and you send it up meeting people where they are. I think that's just so practical. I mean, I think we all have to recognize that we can't be doctrinaire about some of the stuff and we have to just move forward and use the tools and the, the things that people understand. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and I also, I, I want to commend you guys because, and I think it's probably with the two, partly because you are a vocationally orientated college rather than a, uh, a, a full-blown academic university, um, that you're having conversations that we're not hearing people at have, right? That, that uh, you know, we've been saying some of these things to people, but I think you're one of the first that we've heard say this to us um, proactively where you've, where you've done the thinking independently and, 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 and I, it's, it's very aligned with what we've been saying, thinking and, and practicing. So it's, it's, it's fantastic, uh, you know, as hypothesis validation, when you find somebody else who's independently come up with the same idea you have, it's, it's, a, it's a great validation. So uh, yeah, we're, we're, we totally get the journey that you're, you're on and where you are and, and meet those out and you said meeting where you are. So uh, onto the canvas, so, uh, Bob's keen to see what you've been up to. Um, so Lindsay, do you want to take some of that? Because you're a little bit more uh, boots on the street there. Um, I'm a little bit more high level on it. <laughs> well, and again, I will just, am I unmuted? Okay, I am. Um, I'll just maybe say that we're in the very early stages of exploring the applicability of the, of the canvas with our clients. Um, a couple of things that we have found, and I, and I think this echoes some of what you've already heard already, is that um, clients certainly need... Um, to be coached through the canvas. Um, I've had a couple of people attempt to do some of the brainstorming on their own. And when we come and sit down, I, I sort of explode some of their brainstorming. Um, and, uh, and, and so I do think that we, you know, that we're still at a stage where there is quite a bit of coaching involved in working through, um, I think the intricacies of, of the canvas. That being said, I've had many, you know, I've had a, a, a handful of my clients say it really helped them think about and contextualize their thinking of how their enterprise fits within the broader community, which I think is awesome because that's one of its, its primary goals. Um, and you know, and I think we'll see as we get more case studies um, how it works from a, as a, a sort of a, a, a business conceptualization tool to implementation tool. And, and that's kind of where I'm at right now with a few of my clients who have um, gone through the, the sort of the, this kind of conceptualization feasibility phase and are really starting to look at launch. And I'm really curious to see how you can take the canvas as that sort of intro tool um, and, and use it as a, as a tool to guide implementation and, and ongoing implementation. One of the things. Bob, do you have any follow-up question? No, I'd be really curious as to how that works, and also the metrics that they uh, come in with and, and leave with that would help them reinforce the fact that uh, some of the things that they were trying to do to become more flourishing. Yeah. Their enterprise and, and their connections to the community and with each other are going in the right direction. So, what are the indicators that they would normally use, or you would use? to be able to assess how flourishing they are and um, opportunities for them to yeah. become more flourishing. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that it triggers for me and Nicole, something for us to keep in mind as well is um, to actually, uh, to, to make sure that we're embedding the systems to proactively track some of those clients, something that I know happens in our world, and I've seen it already in, in my in my HBEC, the Henry Burnick Center world, is um, you know clients disappear, and do we actually follow up with them to find out where you know three years, four years, five years later, where are they at? How you know, and um, and how have they um, flourished or not or not, and and why and. Um, and I think setting up some of those systems right from the beginning can really help us 
um, embed and ingrain them as we're building out the program over time. Is some of that built into the funding that you received? Or is there it, it, I mean, it probably is within the, it definitely is within the short term, but I'm sort of thinking more long term, right? Mm -hmm. So we report on our funding in, in another year or so. I think it was two year funding. Mm -hmm. um, two year funding isn't really going to give us the benchmarks over time um, on, on the applicability and implementation of, um, it, of the it, tool. It's very interesting to note that one of the things that uh, Alex Austin Oliver, who did the original work on the business model ontology, said in his PhD in 2004, was that longitudinal research about the effectiveness of design-based approaches in terms of do they actually create businesses that last longer or have you know, high, higher outcomes, and obviously he was thinking about profit, um, and do they generate those more reliably, um, needs to be done. And Peter and I repeated that call for longitudinal research in our 2015, 16 paper in, in the journal, in the uh, or in organization and the environment, because that research has not been done. Even, even in the conventional business design world, it has not been done. Uh, so yes, it, uh, I, so I, I also applaud you, uh, Lindsay, for, for thinking about this topic. And it's, uh, if you can be gathering data um, to enable some researchers in a few years from now to be able to do that longitudinal analysis or engage with them now to ensure you're, you're capturing the right data, that would be, as far as I know, globally leading work. Nobody else has done that. Well, we'll get on it. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so yeah, just uh, to, to echo that, I think in this area of the map, I think in some way we were trying to, it's a very nascent sort of tacit uh, uh, responding to that. Um, because um, I know right now in terms of like, so, so we're working also too with um, external advisors at the Senko level. Like we're just talking about the, the, the framework right now. This is just the sessional, um, this is just a sessional series, right? Senko also has also other pillars that it's under, that it's also measuring. But in terms of, you know, how does this sessional framework, you're right, lead to the development of the flourishing ecosystem? I think right now, um, like, like Lindsay, I, I mean, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about that and, and sort of, I think the map was a way to start to look and say, like, you know, that's where the drop zone and the resiliency identification are, but I think there's some deeper work that needs to be done on where we put those benchmarks. And that is actually a very good call to future fit uh, benchmarks um, as well. Uh, so so the other, another term question related to where are you in terms of operationalizing this? So uh, am I correct in saying you, you've currently actually delivered only series one once? That's twice. We've delivered it twice. You've delivered it twice. Okay. So, um, so what's the plan for, for taking cohorts through Fourth, fourth, sorry, fourth series. I can't quite see the. There's three series. So our second series. So the so the first series was ideation and feasibility, and essentially that series was about um, taking the elements of the flourishing business model canvas, and pulling them out of the canvas and ideating on them separately. Yep. Uh, our next series that starts tomorrow is the actual introduction to the flourishing business model canvas, right. um, and sort of working through the canvas and now patching it together so that we can sort of start to get them into a stage where um, we can start to pr get them to go out and prototype and test. Um, and so at that point, after they've sort of built their canvas, they can actually apply to Senko for a traction grant. And the traction grant is designed to go and test something that they've identified in the model that they need. And so that's, again, another great thing about the Georgian ecosystem by working with it is the ability, as part of our funding, was to create traction grants so that they, people could go and test and we could start to benchmark right um, on some of those kind of things so that then we could push them into scale and measure uh, from the individual business side. Um, so, and that will happen. So the, the series three will happen later into what, uh, Lindsay, that's coming in March, April kind of thing. Yeah. Cause we're uh, January, February for the, the business model. And then the, the scale and measure series will be a bit later than that. Um, because one of the other things we wanted to do is we wanted to give a lot of space uh, between these. That was weird. Okay. Anyways, um, that's not coming from me. Okay. That, that was me. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, so uh, respectfully of time. Yes. Um, uh, so I don't know if there was there any more questions or or um, I don't know if that's exactly what you guys were expecting to see tonight. Um, but. <laughs> Well, I, I, I think uh, my, 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 this has been a fantastic introduction uh, and a very powerful introduction to uh, some, some really deep thinking that you guys have done and, and some really exciting 
plans and some early results that you've already developed. Um, and, and I think if I've understood it, you've only been doing this thinking for about a year, a little over a year maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, th I think uh, it's really obvious you, you've done a lot of thinking and you've come a long way in terms of operationalizing that and you've got some really exciting early results. Uh, so I, I think uh, 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 you should invite yourself back, Nicole, <laughs> uh, to present again uh, uh, later on this year uh, or uh, early next year uh, when you, you've got you've taken people through the full, full, full process. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I know, for example, our colleagues in Sweden, in the region of Halam, uh, in the western Sweden, that they, they are in a, a geographical place uh, and, a, and a social uh, a business environment that is very, very similar to the region that Georgia is operating in. Uh, and they are doing some uh, work which is um, both, both very similar in some respects and very different in other respects. Uh, but I think there's, there's lots of potential for some collaborative discussion. So uh, uh, since I'm an adjunct prof there now as well, I can kind of speak on their behalf a little bit. Uh, but I know that they're really, uh, they're, they're going to be really interested. Uh, we met with their economic development people when, we, when I was there in, November. Uh, so I think I think that's that's a key point of collaboration potentially between members of this community uh, that could be of value to both uh, both parts. And if other people are aware of other communities that have a similar um, situ are in a similar situation, uh, then uh, please reach out to Nicole uh, and Lindsay yeah. and, and start those conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just want to add one more thing. I mean, as the community, if anybody sees an opportunity where, like, you can say, like, hey, have you guys thought about this? Or, you know, or looking at it and say, like, you guys should be measuring this. Like, we're opening this up for open conversation. Um, you know, both Lindsay and I live in this community. We've grown, I've grown up in this community. Um, and I think for us, we care very deeply about what happens to our children in this community. Um, we're both moms too, so I always bring that into the conversation. Um, so we really care, um, and, and the great thing about this community has been the response to helping us um, and really looking at making, I mean, we really, we really care about our region we live in. So if you guys have any feedback in terms of how we can improve that or, or how that might happen, we'd be open to hearing it as well. Okay, uh, so the, the only comment I just wanted to make very, uh, very quickly at the end, uh, I mentioned at the end of, of last month, um, we are now starting to finally take some action towards uh, evolving this community from uh, its volunteer status into uh, what we've been talking about as a, a, a global uh, flourishing enterprise institute, uh, a network of nodes. Um, the, um, I, I've been talking to many of you about founding nodes in your places. Um, and uh, so we are actively looking for the first uh, nodes to come together to sign up for a memorandum of exploration to figure out in practice what that could look like for the founding. We would hope for uh, at least two, but maybe as many as four founding nodes. Uh, so the, the organization that's going to be hosting that work is uh, at Wilfrid Laurier University, which is uh, 150 kilometers or so west of Toronto. Uh, we've got a working session with them later on this month. Uh, and so I would just put it out there to any of you if you're interested in uh, potentially uh, talking about this further, please contact Nicole in her role as a community animator. Uh, she can share with you the materials that we've got so far. Um, and obviously we're looking to make sure that there are nodes in uh, multiple geographies. So, you know, this idea of that there are different biomes for business. Uh, and George and I know you've expressed some interest in, in, in this idea. So uh, welcome your engagement through Nicole in, in that process. Um, the final thing I just wanted to mention is next month's uh, uh, presentation, a very different uh, topic. Uh, we have uh, Eric Faf Combs, uh, who's a recent uh, graduate of an MBA program in the Netherlands, uh, whose research was on uh, what are useful business models uh, and business modeling tools and business modeling concepts uh, in the renewable energy uh, space particularly, and uh, again from an innovation a cluster perspective. So he was working with the Dutch Innovation Agency, the TNO, and their renewable energy uh, specific group, HESI. And so he's going to be uh, presenting a summary of his research uh, on that topic uh, next month. And Eric, uh, if you want to wave to everybody, this is Eric. <laughs> uh, and uh, so uh, looking forward to that very much. So as usual, put it in your calendars as a recurring appointment, Tuesday, uh, second Tuesday of each month, uh, for those of you uh, not too close to the international date line, as I've discovered. 
uh, sometimes it ends up being the first Tuesday of the month or the first Tuesday of the month in those cases. But for most people, it's the second Tuesday of the month. It's 4.30 uh, p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, which is UTC plus five. Uh, and uh, looking forward to seeing everybody. And I think the date, as I was finding out earlier, is February the, what do we say? 15th, did we say? No, I mean, I, I'm gonna get this wrong, aren't I? Yeah. But it is February the 12th. February 12th. Good. For those of you who need to actually put it on the other day. So thank you everybody. Uh, thank you again to Nicole and Lindsay for a great presentation. Uh, recording will be up, Nicole, tomorrow. Uh, yep, I will process it and we'll have it up tomorrow for you. Everybody. Okay, and the link to that uh, specific folder for this month will be posted as a comment in the LinkedIn group under this month's presentation, uh, which hopefully you can still find given how badly LinkedIn has messed up everything <laughs> and their group functionality. So with that, have a good evening, everybody. Uh, have a good day for those of you who are tomorrow already and have a good uh, evening or night for those of you who are back today. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.